The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello and welcome to the first Robotics Canada Ask the Experts webinar. These have been bi-weekly webinars, but are going to become weekly now during build season. They're targeted to the FRC community and they're held Tuesdays at 7, although there's a potential time change coming. Uh, look for the links in the FRC Team Blast, uh, the First Canada Facebook page, or on First Robotics Canada socials. And just pause for a minute and admire the new theme. This was completed by a First alum, uh, Rachel Cheng, and it's awesome. So, you know, just enjoy. Oops. And... Our agenda tonight is we're going to start with a little bit of first news and updates, and then we're going to go to game release uh, and possible strategies by Team 772, Saber Bites. And then we're going to have an introduction to coding by Team 771, SWAT. I am your moderator, Sarah Sills. I'm a first senior mentor with First Robotics, and my goal is to help you get the most from this event. Uh, so. You know, sit back, relax, and enjoy. I wanted to start with this. Uh, First Canada just tweeted about it. They're starting to partner with Kids Help Phone, and I think that's super cool. So I just wanted to share the information. Um, they're going to be putting my, uh, more information out each week, so watch for that. Um, and also, uh, these must be drawing to an end because I think it's the third day, but there are three groups in, uh, sorry, there are five groups in Canada doing robot in three days, which is pretty neat. Uh, three of them are in uh, Ontario, and you can see the links there, or just Google them. We've got one in Calgary, so a, a group out west working, AOC, a young uh, presentation in French for our Quebec groups. So I think that's awesome. Good show of diversity there. Um, I wanted to mention Symbotics, or Team 1114, is doing a quick start workshop. Um, and while I'm talking, you might want to jot down that pre-register link, because at this moment, I think this is the only place it is. Uh, but I'm sure it'll be going out tomorrow, and it'll be up in this presentation on YouTube tomorrow. Um, but I wanted to mention this. With the launch of the 2020 season, uh, and this year's game, Symbotics is opening its doors to all teams for a quick start workshop. In this full day workshop, well, it starts at 11, uh, participant teams will join mentors and students from veteran FRC teams to learn the basics and get started with programming, building, and wiring an FRC robot. By the end of the workshop, teams should have a fully functional robot with functional code. So that is super helpful. Um, this workshop's highly recommended for rookie teams and any team who is unsure of any aspect of the FRC robot building process. So that's really helpful and a great workshop. So if you're anywhere near the St. Catharines area and can make it there, um, you know, you need to bring your kit bot or some tools uh, so you can get information and, and join in on that if you'd like. Another uh, workshop coming up is on Limelight. This is going to be run by Team 1360. Um, the information on pre-registers at the bottom, but it's not as long to jot down. Um, this workshop is going to cover the theory on how the Limelight operates and its capabilities, as well as a brief overview of computer vision. It will also cover a setup of demo, uh, sorry, a setup demo and a tuning demo. They're going to do a coding walkthrough and a demonstration or familiarization time using last year's robot and a vision target. So, you know, a couple of things coming up. This is in Oakville, Ontario, so uh, on the west side of Toronto. All right, that's it for news. Uh, I'm going to take us to Saber Bites. So uh, 772, or 77 who, as the question is always asked, um, tonight we have Abby and Andrea representing Team 772. They are based in Windsor, or more specifically, LaSalle, Ontario. It was the first team in that area, and it now has enough teams to be running their own district event. 
They've been growth leaders for FIRST and have traditionally been a team focused on promoting safety to all team members and event attendees. I mentioned that they're one of the hubs. So again, as a uh, tool for people in the kind of Western Ontario area or anyone, um, you can go to that hub. That's on their website, 772, just Google it. And um, they will a answer any questions you have either virtually or, you know, sometimes they'll arrange to come out to your place and lend a hand, send a mentor, or connect with video, whatever works to get your questions answered. So that's a really useful tool that they provide. Um, and I'm going to um, turn it over to Abby and Andrea, who will fill in details about their grades and roles on the team as they present to us about game release. So welcome, and just give me a minute, I'm gonna turn over to their slides. And there you go, Abby. All right, yep. All right, so hi everyone, my name is Abby. Uh, I'm a grade 12 on Team 772, and I am programming leader and also driver for the team. Hi, my name is Andrea. I'm in grade 11. I'm a programmer on the team. All right, so today we're going to be going over the game release as well as uh, some possible game strategies that teams might be going through right now. Um, so to start it off, um, just some key points. We wanted to emphasize to make sure that you understand all of the rules. Um, that's kind of the most important thing of this all. You can't make a strategy and you can't make a robot unless you have read the rules and you have understand them. You definitely want to understand the scoring system since uh, in the playoffs there are the ranking points, or sorry, not in the playoffs, in the quals there are the ranking points, and in the playoffs there are not. So you want to uh, make your strategy to fit that. Uh, so the alliance at the end of with the high score at the end of the match wins, um, but there are also ways to win ranking points throughout the match, such as completing stage stage three, which gets you a ranking point, as well as getting uh, 65 points or higher in the end game, which also gives you a ranking point. Um, now we did have here the point system for the game, um, which goes along with the emphasis of making sure you know the rules and knowing that um, in the playoff matches the ranking points uh, for those two things don't uh, follow, transfer over to points like they have in the years past. So we wanted to just do a quick overview of the game. Yes, yeah, so during the first 15 seconds, there's the autonomous period. They've brought that back from previous years. Uh, droids or robots will follow the pre-programmed instructions that the programmers would program. So the alliances can score points by putting power cells in the power ports and moving from the initiation line. In the final two minutes and 15 seconds, drivers will take control of the robots and continue to score points uh, by putting power cells in the power ports, completing the rotation control and position control, hanging and leveling the, the generator switch. All right, so another thing we added in was the different stages throughout the match. Um, now, we thought this was kind of important. There's been a lot of question questioning on stuff like uh, Chief Delphi about this. So for the stages, which involves putting power cells into the power ports, as well as using the control panel, um, you need to make sure to read stuff like this very carefully. We have realized that um, it's not nine points, it's nine power cells. So stuff like that is really critical to notice because instead of putting nine points, which you would get a lot faster if you were to get it in the outer or the inner port, it's just nine power cells. So if you were faster, if you want to cycle through that faster and score them in the low port, um, you would get through all of the stages faster, which would get you the ranking point um, in the qualification matches. Now, um, when we start our strategy, we always think of uh, the optimal scoring. So without thinking of any mechanisms at all, just standing on the field as a human being, like how would you want to play the game? Yeah, so you want to start with how and where would you want to start? Uh, what you would be doing in auto. So maybe you're going to start right in front of the uh, port and start putting balls in right away. Um, you want to make sure that you know the scoring in the qualifications where you might want to try and work towards the stages as fast as possible 
to get that ranking point, uh, but instead maybe in playoffs, you want to try for higher scores. Um, you want to know and think of different ways how you can work with other robots on your alliance, since uh, you may not be able to place power cells all at the same time in the same place, right? So you might wanna try and think about uh, what your robot could be doing while maybe another robot is doing that, such as uh, shooting at a higher goal from further away or collecting power cells, either from the field or the loading bay. Another thing we like to do is uh, trying to determine our own fate. So do you really wanna have to rely on other teams to get that ranking point for the climb or spinning the control panel, stuff like that? So um, that's kind of the main stuff you wanna think of when you're coming up with these ideas for your strategies. You really want to think of your difficulty compared to your outcome. Um, like Andrea said, what other teams can do while you are working on your own, um, just to optimize your scoring and uh, optimize those ranking points, which would get you higher up in the rankings as the day goes on. All right, so you also want to think of what's achiev achievable for your team. So you don't want to rule out any crazy ideas right away. Anything is possible. Sometimes the best ideas are the craziest. Someone might come up with some crazy idea for leveling the robot on the generator switch, or maybe an idea for a triple climb. You don't want to rule these out right away. Try and think of ways that it might be possible. And you want to focus on what your team thinks is the most important. You don't want to try and bite off more than maybe you can chew, but um, you do want to try and find the more important things uh, to the game that, like we said before, can optimize your scoring. Uh, new teams especially want to pick one or two super important things that they've found. So for example, maybe shooting in the lower port and the climb. And you also want to think of what other teams would want as a first or second pick robot if um, you're not in those top eight spots. Okay, so then after you've came up with a design, you think you know what you want to do and you're thinking about starting to design your mechanism. It's always best to work from the bottom up when you're designing your robot. You don't want to design your whole entire shooter and then figure out where it's going to be sitting on your chassis if you, let's say, haven't designed that yet. Um, you also have to think of some of the trade-offs, so like your speed versus power, your complexity versus your durability. You don't want to make something that's really complex but will get broken really easily. Um, and then there's also shooting versus, ba versus balance. Um, I've noticed a lot of the teams have been talking about, especially teams like that do the robot in three days, they've been choosing to do a, a eight-wheel drive versus six-wheel drive um, because they think that when they're shooting that they're going to be uh, more stable, they're going to be harder to push. Um, so you kind of have to think of things like those when you're designing your mechanisms. Yeah. Uh, we also like to think of how defense is going to play, be played against us, um, where you think the field is going to be the most congested possibly. Is it going to be right in front of the Alliance station where people are going to be possibly in that safe zone shooting? Or is the rendezvous area going to be very congested under there? Um, you also need to think about some of the certain specs on the field. Do you want your robot to be the full max 45 inches high that it can be? Or would you like to make it a bit smaller so it can say go under the trench area and avoid some of that congestion? Um, also thinking about the one inch bump that is in the rendezvous area. How are you gonna go over that? Um, again, with the eight wheel drive thing, some teams are using eight wheel drive because they think that they can get over those bumps easier. If they're sitting, they can turn easier on them. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, you also need to think about, along with the height thing, if uh, your robot's going to have a really good center of gravity. Now, you don't want to be a really tippy robot, um, if especially to go along with the shooting game. If you're really top heavy in your shooting, um, you don't want to be able to tip over very easily. Um, now we're kind of getting into some sort of actual mechanisms a part of this. So let's say for your shooter, where there's a bunch of variables that are going to go in the, into this, where you want to shoot from, the safe zones on the field, whether you're going to have a turret. Um, yeah, you also want to think about uh, different places that you might shoot. So if it's the low goal, the uh, 
outer goal or the inner goal, um, you want to take into account the different points that you can get from these, right? So one, two, or three uh, in teleop, and the accuracy that your robot can achieve. Um, some teams may not be able to get a super accurate shooter that can get into that inner goal from, since it is like two feet back. Um, then you also want to think about uh, whether or not you want to uh, do a ground pickup or a pickup from the feeder station. Um, ground pickup would probably be the best decision in this case, since there will probably be a lot of power cells on the field um, from just being there or uh, missed shots. Yeah, you also might want to be a ground pickup. Uh, let's say that the other alliance isn't shooting as many balls, um, which then would mean that your alliance wouldn't have as many power cells to put back on the field, which would mean that you wouldn't be having anything to shoot with. Um, so then some teams are also talking about uh, flooding the power ports, just rapidly shooting as many balls as they can. Um, that could also be a part of a strategy because we all know that once an alliance reaches 15 uh, power cells in their uh, in their human station, they have to start putting them back onto the field. So if you start firing them in, they'll be coming out right next to you. So that could possibly um, lower your cycle time by quite a bit. Um, also, there's the control panel. So you have to spin that in position that there's a bunch of different ways that you could do that. Um, so you could use, say, like a timer in your code. So it knows how many, how long it has to spin for to get that three to five spins. Or you could put a color sensor on it. Or I can guess there will be a couple of teams out there that will probably just be guessing in general. Um, and then climbing, which is a really big one this year. Do you want to do a buddy climb? Do you want to do a single climb? Are you not going to climb at all? Um, you need to think about which will get you the most points. Um, also, how your climb will be used. So if you have a triple climb, will it really be used, say, at the district level or the world level? Because you'll be competing with the best of the best teams, and they all might have other climbers. So you really got to kind of gauge what you're going to put most of your time into for that. Um, also such as leveling the switches. So some teams, I know there's a couple robot in three days out there that have already made a mechanism that will be able to move along the bar and level off the switch. So will that affect your chances of getting the ranking point or even getting picked because a lot of really good teams aren't even in picking positions. So a part of your strategy is also kind of playing to when you're going to be picked, which also goes along with determining your own fate and trying to get the most points and the most ranking points that you can from a match. All right, and then we have any questions that anybody has. So uh, we do have one question um, that's come in through the question box. So anybody who's listening, feel free to submit questions. Um, the question is, do you think that being able to drive under the trench will be useful skill for this game? So going under the trench could be useful. Um, it all goes along with what your game strategy is going to be, um, which then if you have a smaller robot, you do have to compact a lot of elements into that small design. So I guess it kind of all depends on what the teams really think about it and whether or not they think the rendezvous area is going to be really congested because if it is, it would probably be better to design your robot around the fact that it can go under um, the trench because then you would be able to slip past all of those robots much faster. Yeah, the trench zone itself is a great area to stay away from any defense since it is a safe zone and uh, as well, it's a great way to get down the field fast. Great. I love the insight you're providing the game, not only from your own team and your own thinking, but also from watching some of the robot in three days and, you know, trolling uh, Chief Delphi and see what people are talking about. 
I have a little insight having watched Frank Merritt give a little uh, more information. And he talked about um, the co color wheel was kind of a link to Star Wars. And a lot of the first senior mentors didn't quite see the link. But they said that they were thinking about well, like when R2D2 um, or C3PO were trying to get through certain locks and they like R2-D2 would like plug in and you would see things like spinning and it kind of like he had to unlock something to get through it. So that's what they were thinking about when they were building that, that uh, color wheel. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. We'd also just like to quickly say along with our Sabre Hub, um, we also do have a half field that um, we have now that we've had our robotics class in our school. Um, which we also are opening our field up for teams within the next couple of weeks to practice their autonomouses or their driving in general too. That's excellent. Very helpful. Um, are you going to build that uh, <clears throat> shield generator? Uh, like, are we going to like be able to climb on it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, build the shield generator. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Cool, right. Building that. Um, I could maybe see us building something like it to yeah. practice on. But I know there are team so drawings, but it's you know a challenging build. They said to uh, set it up on the field will take precisely ten people. So there you go. Uh, I know there are a couple of teams out there who have built them in their shops. Mm -hmm. So excellent. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, if you're staying with us in case any other questions come up to the end, um, feel free to stay online and we'll uh, keep con we'll continue on. I'm gonna take back control of the um, screen. All righty. Any minute now. Okay, um, so the next presenter tonight is uh, from 771. Uh, SWAT. And this team also began in the year 2001, minutes before 772, presumably, because the of their team numbers are so close together. Um, SWAT is based out of Oakville, Ontario, and they organize the SWAT Posium each fall. Uh, I think that's been going for, I don't know, six years or something. Uh, and that's an opportunity for teams to attend workshops and learn from each other. Um, fun fact, SWAT is an acronym, not everyone knows, but uh, the S is for their school name, St. Mildred's, and then it's Women Advancing Technology. So there you go. Uh, Lucy is going to be presenting tonight, and, and she's going to be talking about coding. She's going to tell you a bit about herself as she gets started. So Lucy, are you with us? Yeah. Give me a minute and I'll share your screen. You got it? Uh, got it. There we go. And just a note to, to Gian, your second question about the um, strategy, it, we'll get back to after Lucy's presentation. So go ahead, Lucy. So welcome to Programming 101. And this is a beginner's guide and it's for people who don't have much or any experience with programming. 
and it can also serve as a refresher of basic concepts. So the point of this workshop was to explain and clarify basic programming terms and make programming more understandable. You just have to click on your presentation again, and then it, it'll be controlling it again. So I'm Lucy, and this is my third year on the team. I'm currently in grade 10, and I'm the new programming lead this year. So here's an overview of this PowerPoint. So first we have um, the software aspect of programming, and it includes um, variable types, initialization, access modifiers, and the operators and the methods and the if slash else statement. And then next we have uh, command-based programming versus iterative programming, like what's the difference? Um, and we'll be going more uh, into command-based programming. And then the third aspect, it's the hardware aspect of programming. So we'll be covering sensors and then the RoboRio. And then finally, it's the resources, so like websites that are helpful uh, for FRC programming. So what is programming? Programming is the action of writing code to communicate with the robot a set of instructions and commands. So in FRC programming, it will be broken into two parts, the autonomous and the teleop. So the autonomous is the first 15 seconds of the match where the robot either run on pre-programmed, so yeah, they run on pre-programmed code. Um, and then the teleop period is the rest of the match. So the uh, two minute and 15 seconds, and then the robot will move based on the driver and operator's commands. So in both of these parts, the robot will have to perform specific actions based on the year scape. Uh, so here's an example of what programming looks like in first. So the purple represent command categories. So um, for instance, public class will hold all the information about, uh, uh, yeah, public class will hold all the information and that so doubles will hold all the information about shooter motor factor. And then the blue, the yeah, the blue represent the names. So we try to keep them logical. So it actually makes sense for other programmers to look at our code. And this is especially important when your team has a bigger programming sub team making the name logical can be easily accessible and comprehensible by other uh, other programmers. And then the black, um, the black just represent the group of information. And yeah, so now going on to variable types. So this part is split into three numbers, flow and other. So first we have number. A byte is a number that takes the space of one byte or eight bit. And then, and then a short is a number that takes the space of two bytes or 16 bit. And then the integer short for int is a number that takes the space of four bytes or 32 bit. So in FRC programming, we typically use um, integer the most often out of uh, out of these three, just because it's difficult to find instances when, uh, when like we when the space when the number only takes a space of like one byte or two bytes. Oh yeah, and there's also a long. And then next we have float. Um, so there's um, uh, yeah, float is a single a uh, 32 bit floating point and then double is a 64 bit floating point. So um, double is used to represent decimals or fractional values. So we use a uh, double very often as well. And then next we have the other type. So there's a char short for a character. So a character t is a 16 bit character. Uh, yeah, 16 bit character. So that just represent any value that takes the form of like letters, so like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then a string is a series of um, characters. Um, so like hello world is a string because it has multiple letters. And then a Boolean only 
has like two possible values, true or false. And then in real life, a light switch work uh, somewhat similar as a Boolean because there's only uh, two values on and off. Um, so next going to initialization. So um, there are three steps to initialization. And then the first step is to indicate the variable type. So as I mentioned before, there are many different types of variables, but the ones we use most often are integer, double string, and character, and then Boolean. And then the second uh, step is to give it a name. So uh, any name works, but we want them to be logical. And then the third step is to give it a value. So um, the example below is an example of initialization because integer in a case of variable type and then x in the case the name and then zero is the value. So here's more examples of creating and initializing objects in MSC programming. So can tell and write motor one, can tell and write motor two. Here's creating uh, the objects. So we're just saying that we have two uh, can talent and then uh, one's write motor one and the other one's write motor two. And then after a public void robot in it, the write motor one that's assigning a um, value. So um, right motor one equals new can tell in bracket one. The one represent the port number. So what port number the uh, right motor one is plugged into. And then same for uh, right motor two. So right motor two is plugged into port number four. Um, and then here's um, access modifiers. So there's three types of access modifiers. Um, in programming. So the first type is public. So that means it's overall accessible. Um, so like, um, so like other class or like other files can access that file as well. And then pri conversely, private is only accessible in that class. Um, and then protected, sorry, protected is special because subclasses or like methods and functions, they can access uh, within a class can access. Um, yeah. Okay, so now going on to operators. So there are four categories of operators. So assignment, arithmetic, relational, and logical. So the assignment operator, uh, so Equal sign means uh, equal like in math. So one is assigned to integer x. And then the plus and equal sign means um, is. And then, yeah, and then, um, and then here are examples of um, these operators in the third column. And then for arithmetic, and then plus minus is the same thing. And then, yeah, that, and then the star is multiplication. And then the next one is division. And then the percentage sign is um, to divide two numbers and return the remainder. And then the two uh, plus signs means, uh, means the, number, the number is increased by one. And then the two minus signs means that the number is decreased by one. And then the third category is relational. So it returns Boolean, true or false. Um, and then the two double sign means the same thing. So, so X is Y and that's false. And then the explanation mark and the, the, uh, the equal sign means, um, means like um, it does not equal to Y, but like does not equal to. And then the rest is the same as math, uh, like the math operators. And then the fourth category is logical. So uh, the two and sign is just and. And then the next one means or. And then the last one, so the explanation mark means not. So it's used to reverse a statement. And then here are examples of these operators in the third column. So now going on to command-based programming versus um, iterative robot. So command-based programming is a project that allows robot um, to implement a command-based model to follow, um, to follow 
complex functionality and be developed into simpler functionality. Um, and the iterative is a robot project that allows robot to be implemented in the iterative manner. So basically command, command base split a large file of code into smaller files. Um, and then an iterative robot is everything in one uh, giant file. So here are like the sub classes in command based. So, oh, I, I think it stands for operator input. So here's where you would put um, like dry sticks information, like, uh, like driver dry sticks and the operator dry sticks into uh, OI. For example, you can put um, like, uh, like um, a certain button is assigned to like opening a clamp or things like that. And then the robot is like the hub of the program. Um, so it's like the heart of the program. Um, and then the subsystems. So um, the pro programmers basically list um, physical components of the robot into subsystems. For example, um, the drivetrain or like uh, different motors or like talents and stuff. And then commands is the code for controlling the subsystems. Um, because in subsystems, you're only stating what's on the robot. You're not telling the robot to um, explicitly to do something. Um, and that's where commands come in because command is what you tell the robot to do this. For example, you tell the robot to drive straight or uh, whatever. So next is if slash else statements. So um, if an else statement. So if the condition is met, so if distance is less than tr uh, two and that is true, then you will execute the conditional code as you can see in the flow chart. And then if the distance is not two, or in other words, um, the condition is not met, then you will skip the conditional code. Um, and then the next is the to if statement. So in this case, um, if distance is less than two, and then if distance is bigger than one, and then you execute a conditional code, so you don't skip, uh, you don't skip over the conditional code. And here are examples of if-else statements in FRC programming. Um, as you can see, uh, yeah, so if-else is a condition statement where if the condition isn't true, the code does as the else statement says. And then, and then the other one, a conditional statement where nothing occurs if the condition isn't true. And here are examples of if an if a statement in uh, robotics. Um, so for instance, the if a statement, if um, x is not bigger or equal to the negative threshold and x is not um, less or equal to the threshold, then you would skip the uh, conditional code and do what else say. So you would skip the return zero. And then here are more embedded if else statements within the if else statement. Um, okay. So now going on to the hardware part of programming. So the Robo Rio is basically the brain of the robot because it stores and run code. So it serves as the main processing unit and acts like a mini computer. Um, also, it can connect to many different types of devices, such as like motor controllers and sensors. And here's a picture of the Robo Rio. Um, yeah, here's a picture of the Robo Rio. And the different number represent like the different ports and what you can connect, um, connect it with. Um, so now going on to sensors. So we have two different types of, it's split into two groups. One that measures orientation and then the other group. So 
the compass is pretty straightforward. It tells you the direction north, south, east, and west. But because our team haven't used compass in the past, so I don't really know other information about compass. Um, and then for gyroscopes, short for gyros, um, it can be, it measures and conveys orientation. So it can be used to get uh, your robot to point at a certain angle, as well as keeping an angle while driving. So it's useful in the sense that when you're, when a driver is driving the robot, uh, for example, if another robot bumps into your robot, it can autocorrect itself to the right uh, angle while driving. Um, and then the accelerometer measures acceleration relative to the inertia. So inertia means a not moving, so it measures acceleration. And then rangefinder measures um, the distance from the robot to the target. And then the other type of sensors that doesn't measure orientations are encoders, potentiometers, uh, camera, and the vision processing. So for encoders, it measures rotation um, that can be applied as like speed or distance. Um, and then for the potentiometer, it measures like angular rotation or linear motion. And then camera and vision processing often uh, works together as the camera allows drivers to see the field uh, from, their, yeah, from the robot. For instance, last year um, in deep space, during the sandstorm period, our driver used the camera um, to see the field from the robot. And then vision processing, um, apply a filter to the video with the target to better focus, shoot, or identify. So this is used when they're reflexive uh, tape on the, on the field. So, um, so the vision processing can like filter out the reflexive tape and allow the drive, driver to uh, better focus um, to place um, like power cells. Um, okay. So finally, we have resources. So after your mentors, Google is your best resource. Don't be afraid to Google something because even our mentors will Google things they don't know and other people will have the same problems as you and Google. So Google is a great resource. Um, and then next, YouTube. So there are lots of men uh, mentors from like different teams that post videos about like um, programming. Um, I think Beta Vaults on YouTube have like a series of videos on like command based programming or like introduction to programming. So it's really helpful for a beginning programmer to get a sense of uh, what programming is like in FRC. Um, and then there's also WPI uh, Lib. So it tells you like the different software component and it also tells you like uh, what you need to update and like um, etc and then on the left hand side it has like different um it has information on like uh java c plus plus um and etc and they also have like information on uh different types of sensors and how to program sensors um and yeah um, and then API is like the, it's like when you import packages from um, uh, in programming and it's useful to know what package, pa packages are available and that's where you find uh, what packages to import. So it's under WPI load. Um, and then finally, this is a programming tutorial. Um, PowerPoint um, created by Taylor Uva. Um, so if you search that up, it has like an entire PowerPoint um, and it tells you step by step, um, like how to program. And then um, it has like pictures and stuff to show you all the hardware component and then software component. And it also teaches you about different sensors and pneumatics. So it's very helpful for beginning programmers too and it's easy to follow. 
Um, and then that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. That was awesome. I really liked um, just the basic introduction because getting your feet on the ground um, can help you to feel, you know, just more confident going forward. So when people start throwing out all these terms and, you know, you have a basis to start from, that's great. Um, and the uh, Robo Rio, I like that you talked about some of the hardware. The Robo Rio is the most expensive piece on your robot generally. So, you know, be careful with it. And, you know, just, you know, a little uh, benefit that that's in uh, the software programmer's hand. Um, so uh, that's kind of the brain of it all. I chuckled a little bit about the doors opening and closing behind you because um, I think that's your team, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty hard to find a quiet space when a team is building. So that just felt very real. Um, and they did a great job staying quiet. We just couldn't hurt, could hurt, hear the door now and then. Um, and probably software like uh, the programming group right now is is focused a lot on downloading the, the new things for this year. Is that true? Yeah, and like updating and then configuring like the radio and then like the talent and the local radio. Right. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to take back control of the screen. Um, I do have, look, it looks just the same as yours. I do have one more question uh, for 772 if they're there. Um, yep. Oh, excellent. There is another question about uh, the control panel, and they're saying, given that you have to reach capacity, is the control panel worth it? Do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, so I guess it depends on what your whole entire team strategy is. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand with determining your own fate. So do you really want to have to rely on one of your other team members being able to do that on their own? Um, now, personally, we do think it is uh, a very good thing that majority of teams should be, um, should be able to do. Um, let's just say you're going to an event and you're with two rookie teams who not really saying they won't but might not be able to do the control panel you want to be able to kind of do that not per se for them but to help um, get that extra ranking point they might be able to load the balls in and you're kind of going to want to have somebody able to do that but again it all depends on your team strategy and whether or not you want to be able to determine your own fate there and getting those points. Right, that was a good response. Um, I think I, for the summary, I have you know tips of if you're looking for something to do. I know now that we've hit build season, you know people are still looking for things to do. <coughs> Maybe not all your weekends are full. So um, some ideas I had was. The FLL Provincials are coming up um, this coming weekend, and I love it that we have both an East and a West. So um, the East is taking place on January 11th in Oshawa, and then uh, the West is taking place February 1st in Waterloo. Um, and there's also another thing for FLL called the Ontario Innovation Celebration, and that's in North Toronto up in Markham on February 22nd at Seneca College. And that's um, more triggered around the like all the best projects that came through. Um, so that's kind of a neat thing too. So if you you know don't have your fill of FLL or you have a team that you're supporting that's involved in that, um, you could go to that. The other thing that's happening in, on January 12th, that's a Sunday, at Durham College in Oshawa is the FTC Provincials. And this is kind of exciting because it's the first time we first year we've run FTC in Canada. That's first tech challenge. And uh, so this is the, the only event we're having is the provincial event. Um, but next year we're looking at the program expanding quite a bit more. And so... Um, if you're thinking about or you know some other schools near you that, you know, uh, are looking for a, perhaps a slightly smaller version of FRC, 
to uh, start with or, you know, because their school doesn't have the facilities or ability to support an FRC team, that might be a way you could get started running a team at their school. Um, so maybe you want to come and check that out. Uh, so that's going on. Um, or, hey, maybe you just want to volunteer at an event. So I know that the, um, you know, on the weekends that you're not competing, maybe you want to get out there on the floor and volunteer. So you can always just go to your first dashboard and um, sign up, find, you know, find an event or a weekend that you're uh, available and, and um, take a look at that. Um, I wanted to give a very big thank you to 772 for helping us out. Uh, they're going to be back next week, too, since they seem to be our game specialists this year. Um, they're going to talk about the <laughs> game rules. In particular, you know, we want to learn them. So there are going to be some game rules fun to help us learn uh, the rules better. Um, and another big th uh, shout out to 771 for getting us started on our coding. I also love those link to resources. So there's some neat resources if you want more. And Lucy's given her email um, if you have specific questions. Um, so next week we will, on the 14th, we'll have 772, as I mentioned, and also 1241 or Theory 6 is going to be with us. They're going to be talking about building tips and specifically related to autonomous. So they're, um, you know, kind of focused on what do you want to get done during autonomous. Um, and of course, you'll be using those uh, elements during teleop, but, you know, just kind of that focus on autonomous. And I mentioned we're looking at the time. There's a conflict at seven o'clock. So we're looking at maybe taking it uh, for an earlier start at six. I know a lot of our audience uh, watches it later on YouTube, so that might work for us. Uh, but we'll all confirm that, and it'll be up uh, when the links go up uh, for next week. Um, if you have any questions or any time, or you're thinking that your team wants to get involved and ask the expert, then please email me. We still have a few topics open that we're looking for teams to um, lend a hand on, uh, or maybe you just have a great idea of something we all should be learning. So that's good too. Um, so go ahead and email me if you get a chance. And it looks like we're uh, done ahead of schedule. I love that. Um, the uh, recording of this will be up on YouTube starting tomorrow. Uh, so you can go, it's on the first Robotics Canada uh, channel and it's uh, in its own playlist. So you can look for the playlist and hey, watch them all or just watch tonight's or, you know, point people to it if you think it would help them. So thank you to everyone for participating tonight. Have a great first week of build. It's super exciting. Um, and goodbye for tonight.